Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman of the Football History Dude Podcast, and I'm stopping by this show real quick to tell you about a couple of cool giveaways that we have going on here at the network. Both are autographed books covering various topics of the NFL. The first is The Point After, How One Resilient Kicker Learned There Is More to Life Than the NFL by ex-NFL kicker Sean Conley. It goes over his unique experience as a walk-on kicker at the University of Pitt after never playing high school football. And then it gets into some of his time playing for NFL teams and so much more beyond the gridiron. The other is from author Kevin Bryant. His book is titled Spies on the Sidelines, the High Stakes World of NFL Espionage. This book started as a curiosity, kind of a passion project to understand everything revolving around well, Spygate. But this put Kevin down a rabbit hole learning about all sorts of espionage that has occurred throughout the history of the NFL. Both permissible <laughs> and often the illicit techniques of gathering intel to try to impact the outcome of the game. To sign up for your chance to win an autographed copy of one of these books, all you gotta do is head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways and sign up. That's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways. Again, check out all the other podcasts that we have in the Sports History Network as well. But now, back to your regularly scheduled journey to the Sports History Timeline. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello once again, sports fans, and welcome to this latest edition of the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Dana Augusta, and I would like to thank each and every one of you out there for taking time out of your busy day to give us a listen whenever and wherever you're listening to us. And if you like what we do here, please don't hesitate to subscribe wherever you listen to this podcast. And as a reminder, we're on Twitter at HistoricallySP2 where we post different sports history items every single day. Now, on this episode of the podcast, we're going to take a look back at a team that pulled off one of the greatest comebacks in the history of North American team sports. A team who was literally given up for dead by the 4th of July, and by that October had won their very first World Series in one of the biggest upsets in the early history of the World Series. That is our main event. Later in the program, we're going to send a shout out to one of the greatest managers in baseball history. A manager who was at the helm for one team for 30 years and compiled over 2,500 wins in his long career. And also, as usual, our top five historical events that celebrated anniversaries this past week. That and so much more here on the latest edition of the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast, a proud member of the Sports History Network. Hey there, football fans. This is Ross the host of the Pigskin Tales podcast. Give me a second to talk about Joe Zagorski's pro football in the 1970s. In the 70s, the sport of pro football grew in popularity like never before. The game became more modern, more technologically savvy, and thanks to the tinkering of the rules throughout the decade, the product that one saw in pro football made the struggle on the field so much more exciting to watch. When you hear Joe Zagorski talk about pro football in the 1970s, it will bring you back to a time and place where your recollections of the 70s are joyfully relived once again. Joe explores many different facets and elements of the 70s, like the players, the teams, the games, the controversies, and the legacies that surround the decade. Take a listen to Joe Zagorski, an NFL author and host of the Pro Football in the 1970s podcast. It's just one of the great podcasts available through the Sports History Network. Check them out at sportshistorynetwork.com.
And we're back once again, sports fans. I'm Dana Augusta, and you're listening to the Historically Speaking Sports Podcast. And right now, we are in the main event segment of the show. And just a reminder, if you like what we do here and you like what you're listening to, please don't hesitate to subscribe to our show. And also, you check us out on Twitter at HistoricallySP2 for your daily dose of sports history. Now, on our main event, we'll feature a team that made one of the biggest in-season comebacks, not only in the history of Major League Baseball, but also in the history of pro sports. Now, a few months back, we discussed here on the show the World Series history of the Atlanta Braves. The Braves as a franchise had a very long and distinguished history in the National League, a history that dates back all the way to their days as the Boston Red Stockings during the 1870s. As a franchise, the Braves have won four world championships and, as, and is the only team in Major League Baseball history to have won the World Series representing three different cities. The Braves have, of course, won two here in Atlanta and won as the Milwaukee Braves in 1957 and their first going all the way back to 1914 as then they were the Boston Braves. In 91, the Atlanta Braves went from worst to first as they were a struggling franchise throughout the decade of the 1980s and ended up going to the World Series and eventually losing to the Twins in seven games who also pulled off that from worst to first distinction in the American League that season as well. However, the 1914 Boston Braves would go from worst to first in just a little span of about three months. Now, before the season started, in 1913, actually, the Braves finished fifth in an eight-team National League. That season, they had a 69-82 and record and were not expected to be contenders in the National League in 1914. During that time, teams like the New York Giants, led by manager John McGraw, and the St. Louis Cardinals were the class of the National League. As the 1914 season began, Boston stumbled out of the gate, winning just two games in their first ten, and things got even worse. In the middle of May, the Braves had lost seven in a row, and by the end of May, just two months into the season, all had seen lost, as they were 10-22 and 22 on a young season, 11 games out of first behind the New York Giants. At several points during the month of June, the Braves fell even further behind. On June 8th, after a 3-2 loss to Cincinnati, Boston was 13 and a half games out of first, and by the 4th of July of 1914, the Braves were pretty much out of it losing to the Brooklyn Dodgers 4-3, placing them 15 games out of first place. Two days later, on July the 6th, the Braves had a modest 3-1 win over Brooklyn, and at the time, it didn't really mean much. However, that would begin a hot streak that would be the mother of all hot streaks. Boston would win seven of their next eight, and from July 27th through August the 6th, the Braves would win an incredible nine in a row. Led by manager George Stallings and pitchers Dick Rudolph, Lefty Tyler, and Bill James, the Braves began to surge up the standings in a way that overwrought sports writers and fans had never seen before. By the beginning of September, the Braves had caught up to the Giants at the top of the standings. And on September the 7th, the Braves defeated Philadelphia 7-1 at the Baker Bowl and had tied the Giants atop the National League standings, both teams holding a 67-52 record, and both would face each other in a crucial three-game series two days later. The Braves would take two or three from the Giants in that crucial series, gaining the lead in the National League, a lead they, they would not relinquish. During that stretch of run that season, the Braves would have another nine-game winning streak and would finish the season with a record of 94-59 winning the National League pennant. Since the 4th of July of that year, the Braves went from 15 games out of first to capturing the pennant. During that stretch, they went 68-19 and over their last 87 games of the regular season. And you may think that the Braves may have had to squeeze past the Giants to win the pennant that year. Well, you would be wrong. There was no pennant race in the National League in 1914. The Braves would finish 10 and a half games ahead of the second place Giants. To put the Braves post 4th of July surge into perspective, consider this. The Braves 68 wins since July the 6th was one fewer than the 69 wins Boston had all of the 1913 season. On offense, the Braves were led by Hall of Famer Walter Rabbit Marinville, 
with 78 RBIs and 28 stolen bases. Outfielder Joe Connolly had a 306 batting average and led the team with just nine home runs, tied for the most in the majors that year. Nine home runs, yeah, you gotta remember, this is the middle of the dead ball era. The Braves were riding high and surprising the baseball experts by winning the National League pennant by a large margin. Yet according to those same baseball experts at the time, they were considered a major underdog against the American League pennant winners, the Philadelphia Athletics led by Hall of Fame manager Connie Mack. The A's were the current baseball dynasty, winning three of the last four World Series, including beating the Giants in the 1913 series four games to one, and came into the World Series with a record of 99 and 53. Pacing the A's offensively was their so-called $100,000 infield of Stuffy McGinnis, Eddie Collins, Black Jack Barry, and Frank Home Run Baker, who led the American League with nine home runs. Meanwhile, Collins, the A's shortstop, was the American League's most valuable player that year. In Game One at Shy Park, Philadelphia, on, in Philadelphia, on October the 10th, the Braves held the powerful A's to one run in a seven-to-one win and a one-game-to-none advantage of the series. An advantage they wouldn't relinquish. The next day in Game Two, Bill James pitched a complete game shutout, blanking the A's one to nothing in the classic pitchers' duel. James allowed just two hits and struck out eight, as the Braves' lone run came in the top of the ninth when Charlie Deal doubled with one out and later stole third, and with two outs, Les Man singled to center field, scoring Deal for the game winner. The Braves were ahead two games to none in the series and was heading back to Boston for games for the next three scheduled games. In game three at brand new Fenway Park, the Braves and A's would go on to extra innings at both teams ending nine innings in a two to two tie. Philadelphia would score two in the top of the 10th, but the Braves would answer scoring two in the bottom half of the inning, not even to score at four, and it would stay that way until the bottom of the 12th. That was when Hank Gowdy would hit a line drive deep into left center field and bounce into the spectators for a ground rule double. After an intentional walk, Mann, pitch running for Gowdy, would score from second on a throwing error by Stuffy McGinnis, and the Braves would win in a in walk-off style five to four in 12, in 12 innings. The Miracle Braves were just one win away from shocking the baseball world and winning their first ever World Series. The next day in Game 4, with the score tied 1-1 in the bottom of the fifth, the Braves made their move on the title. With two outs facing Braves pitcher Bob Shock, A's pitcher Bob Shockey, Dick Rudolph singled, that was, which was followed by a Herbie Moran double moving Rudolph to third. With runners on second and third and with two outs, Johnny Evers singled, scoring Rudolph and Moran. With the series holding a with the Braves holding a three to one lead, it was just four innings away from their first title. Rudolph would finish off the A's and the series. Stuffy McGinnis would ground out to end the series as the Braves not only upset the favorite Athletics but beat them in a sweep four games to none. Long before the sprint running New York Giants that took the pennant from the Dodgers in 1951 and the shot in the shot heard around the world, and long before the Miracle Mets of 1969, there was baseball's original miracle team. The Miracle Braves of 1914, a team that was in last place on the 4th of July and ended up winning both the National League pennant and the series. And in a sweep, no less. And that was this week's main event chronicling the 1914 Boston Braves that went from last place to first place during the middle of the season. And coming up later on the show, we're gonna send out to a manager that we talked a little bit about in this segment and one that started his career as the manager of the New York Giants this week in 1902. So please stay tuned for that. But coming up next is our top five of historical events that took place this past week. So please stay tuned. The Pigskin Tales podcast is all about the lesser known pro football players. Yes, there are stories about the ones we know, like Fran Tarkenton and Red Grange. But... Have you ever heard of Ernie Nevers? How about Dave Osborne or even Grady Alderman? These men created their own path to the NFL. How did they do it? Listen to the Pigskin Tales podcast, now streaming on your favorite music platform to get podcasts. And sports fans, we're back, and thank you for joining us here at the Historically Speaker Sports Podcast, a proud member of the Sports History Network. Right now is our... Top five historical moments that are celebrating anniversaries this past week. 
And this has been a very historical week, not only in sports history, but also American and world history. Who could forget on July 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin became the first men to walk on the moon. That happened this week in history, and we're going to do, the very, do a very similar thing, but in the world of sports. So with that said, let's get started with the countdown with the historical events that took place between the dates of July 17th and July 23rd. Number five, Bill Wright becomes the first African-American golfer to win a major golf tournament. On July 18, 1959, playing at the U.S. Amateur Public Lynx Championship at Wellshire Golf Course in Denver, Bill Wright became the first African-American golfer to win a United States Golf Open Major Tournament. Wright complete, competed that week with only 12 clubs, two woods, nine irons, and a putter. That was good enough because he defeated Frank Campbell 3-2 in the final match of the tournament to claim the tournament title. He attended Western Washington College and won the 1960 NAIA Men's Golf Championship. He turned professional in the early 1960s and played in several PGA Tour events, including making the cut in the 1966 U.S. Open at the Lake Course at the Olympic Club in San Francisco. Number 4. Hank Aaron hits his 755th and final home run. On July the 20th, 1976, Hank Aaron, now playing for the Milwaukee Brewers, connected on a career home run number 755 in a 62-win over the California Angels at Milwaukee County Stadium. The, pla the blast came in the bottom of the seventh inning off of Angels reliever Dick Drago. The home run was actually the second in back-to-back -back home runs by the Brewers. In the at-bat before, George Scott connected on a solo shot against Drago. It would be the final home run for, Homer, for Hammer and Hank, playing in the city where he started his major league career. In fact, Hall of Famers Aaron, Babe Ruth, and Willie Mays are some of the few players in the history of Major League Baseball to start and end their careers in the same city but with different teams. While Aaron started with the Milwaukee Braves and he ended it with the Milwaukee Brewers, Babe Ruth came up with the Boston Red Sox and ended it with the Boston Braves. Meanwhile, Willie Mays, who started his career with the New York Giants, ended it with the New York Mets. Number three, speaking of New York teams, Carl Hubble begins historic winning streak. On, October, on July 17, 1936, Carl Hubble of the New York Giants pitched a complete game shutout against the Pittsburgh Pirates at Forest Field. Though no one knew it at the time, that would be the beginning of the longest winning streak by a pitcher in Major League Baseball history. Hubble, the ace of the New York Giants, who was known for striking out Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Al Simmons, Jimmy Fox, and Joe Cronin in the 1934 All-Star Game, would win, 30, would win 24 excuse me, consecutive starts that lasted until May of the following season. In those 24 games, King Carl would pitch 207 and two-thirds innings, allowing 45 runs on 159 hits and recording 104 strikeouts. In those 24 games, 18 were complete games and only three were no decision. Now in keeping with unbreakable records, number two, Cy Young wins career number 500. In a sport where there are unbreakable records, then there's the then there's a record held by Cy Young. On July 19, 1910, Cy Young, pitching for the Cleveland Naps, beat the Washington Senators 5-2 in 11 innings to claim career, number five, career win number 500. Young is the only pitcher to reach 500 wins. He finished with 511 in total, while Walter Johnson, the big train, is in second place with just 417 wins. He began his career with the Cleveland Spiders of the National League in 1890, and his career lasted for the better part of 21 seasons. And the number one historical event that took place in the world of sports this past week, Joe DiMaggio's 56-game hitting streak comes to an end. There are several records in sports that are suffice to say permanent, like the one we just talked about. But Joe DiMaggio's 56-game winning streak that took place in 1941 is one of those records that I really do personally believe will stand the test of time. The 1941 season stands apart as one of the best all-around seasons ever. That season, not only you had Joe's and Joe's hitting streak, but you also had Ted Williams batting over 400 for a season, which to this day has never been equal all these years later. 
And plus, at the end of the season was the first ever meeting in the World Series between the New York Yankees and the Brooklyn Dodgers in an epic series. But the 1941 season belonged to the man they called the Yankee Clipper. On May 15, 1941, the streak began with an RBI sing single against White Sox relief pitcher Edgar Smith. Though no one knew it at the time, it would begin a phenomenon that would captivate the country in the summer before America's entry into World War II. The streak lasted all through the summer as he approached two insurmountable records that loomed ahead of him. George Sisler's modern-day American League 41 consecutive game hitting streak which was set back in 1922 and the all-time record of 44 consecutive games with a hit which was set by Wee Willie Keeler back in 1896. After passing Sisler, DiMaggio set his sights on passing Keeler. On July the 2nd, he passed Keeler with a home run to left field over Red Sox outfielder Ted Williams. And after that, the hits just kept coming. The streak ended at Cleveland Municipal Stadium on July the 17th. And although the Yankees won the game 4-3, DiMaggio's streak ended as he went 0-3 with a walk. The streak that ended at 56 games and 81 years later since Joe DiMaggio's streak, only Pete Rose has come close to matching it going 44 consecutive games with a hit with the Cincinnati Reds back in 1978. And that was this week's top five historical moments from the week that was. And coming up next is another baseball icon from the Big Apple who stepped down from his managerial position after 30 years of service. Please stay tuned. Hey there, football fans. This is Ross, the host of the Pigskin Tales podcast. I just need a few moments of your time to talk about the host of the Pigskin Dispatch podcast, Darren Hayes. He's expanded the pig pen to search out information on the history of all team sports. It's a quest to find out about the competitors, teams, and places chronicled throughout athletic history through the uniforms and gear the participants used and wore. And he is taking you, the listener, with him on this educational journey to preserve sports history on the Sports Jersey Dispatch, found here on the Sports History Network. His newest podcast, called Jersey Dispatch, is all based on the jerseys that all the greats used to wear. You can find Darren Hayes and the Pigskin Dispatch podcast, as well as Jersey Dispatch, on your favorite podcast provider multiple times each week. So remember that, Darren Hayes, the host of the Pigskin Dispatch and Jersey Dispatch podcasts. It's found right here on the Sports History Network. Come prop up on Thrive Fantasy this football season. Thrive Fantasy is a daily fantasy sports and esports app for player props. With Thrive, you can eliminate the countless hours of research and focus on only the top tier athletes that have the biggest impact on the game. Choose 10 out of the 20 available player props to build your lineup. Each prop is assigned a fantasy value for both the over and the under based on how likely it is to hit. Hit the most props and rack up the most points to win a share of the prize pool. Thrive has over $140,000 guaranteed in prizes for the NFL in week one. Thrive's featured contest is $20 to enter and first place takes home a cool 20 k When you sign up today, use the promo code SHN and you'll get a 100% instant first deposit match up to $100. If you go through the Sports History Network website, sportshistorynetwork.com slash thrive, you don't even need to enter the promo code. You automatically get the deposit bonus. Download the Thrive Fantasy app on the App Store or Play Store now. You can play online at thrivefantasy.com. Sign up and prop up today. Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io. And we're back. And to wrap up the show, we're going to do our usual weekly shout out segment talking about a, a specific figure in the world of sports that had a little bit of an impact historically this past week. 
and we're going to talk about a major, major figure, not only in the world of baseball, but New York baseball to be more specific. Now, in the early part of the 20th century, New York Giants manager John McGraw was as big a figure in baseball as a manager than almost any other player, manager, or even an owner. McGraw was a ferocious player during his time as a member of the Baltimore Orioles in the early and mid 1890s. And his later managerial style closely resembled his style as a player. Underneath that tough exterior, though, was a baseball genius who his trademarks were daring, unrelenting, and scrappy teams that played in northern Manhattan. In the middle of the 1932 season, citing poor health, McGraw decided to retire from the Giants, but his impact on the team and the sport is still felt to this very day with his strategy. A strategy that included his use of relief pitching and singling pitch, and pitch types to the catcher during the game. He won a grand total of 2,763 games as a manager, which is third all-time behind legendary Connie Mack and former A's and Cardinals skipper Tony La Russa. After leaving the Baltimore Orioles, he took the reins of the New York Giants as manager, and he would retain that post for 32 seasons from, 1932, from 1902 to 1932. And during that period, McGraw would lead the Giants to 10 National League pennants and three World Series titles, including back-to-back -back titles against Babe Ruth and the New York Yankees that, he, his, that his Giants defeated in 1921 and 1922. McGraw was the prototype of the modern coach. Simply, he was a player's coach, someone who was hard on his men, but this men also respected. McGraw would, would die just two seasons, two years after retiring from the game, and was, he was regarded by many as the greatest of all baseball managers. And I want to thank you for, God, for joining us, guys, and I really appreciate it coming to you live and direct from our studios here in Atlanta. Please don't forget to subscribe to get new episodes whenever they come out, and also check, take a look at our Twitter feed, which is historically sp2. You can check us out on Twitter. So please take a look at that whenever you have time. And one more time, thank you for joining us. Please take care and have a great week, everybody. offices of the Pittsburgh Guardian newspaper circa 1924. But for Marla Delft, assistant editor, everything was about to change. For she was about to discover the awesome attractiveness of Row 1 brand retro sports paraphernalia items thanks to Orville Mulligan, sports writer. And there it is. Wow, Orville, that's really the bee's knees. Isn't it just? A poster-sized replica of the actual 1909 World Series program cover. I can see that. But where did you get it? And where'd you get it framed? I ordered it from the Row 1 website, where over 6,000 items of sports memorabilia from the 1880s to the 1990s are available for reproduction in multiple sizes and in several different materials, with over a dozen styles of frame to choose from for prints like this. Well, I'm sure Mr. Delft would love to put up more of these in the office. But I'm equally as sure they're beyond this newspaper's budget. <laughs> Not at all, my dear Marla. See for yourself. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Oh my, these are good prices. Oh, and look at this stuff. Oklahoma, Nebraska football. College basketball art. Michael Jordan items. And so Retro it was that Marla Delft discovered the spondiferous magic of row one sports memorabilia arts and Prince. You can, too, by visiting sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. That's R-O-W number one today for access to the full row one catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains.
at today for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at checkout. And keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan, sports writer, coming soon. Oh,